weeks, we'll wrap this up. But uh, tonight is what does the Bible really teach? And water baptism during Christ's earthly ministry and before the Apostle Paul. I hope that you got a handout as you came in. If you didn't raise your hand, we'll make sure that you get one. Anyone need a handout tonight? There's a little bit of information in there, quite a bit of verses. Okay, wonderful. Looks like everyone got a handout. Thank you so much. Well, one over there. And uh, thank you so much, Tommy. appreciate that. <clears throat> and some said, well, sounds like to me you preached your voice out this morning. Not really. I'm just having a little bit of sinus issue, so I hope that you'll bear with me. And uh, so, you know, I don't know. It just happens, but uh, it won't hold me back from preaching. And uh, if not, I'll just get Melissa up here to preach it. No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. TV, internet, kidding. All right. But uh, we're glad that you're here. And, you know, on the issue of baptism, I've noticed that, uh, you know, baptism or you mind if I loosen my tie? You don't mind, do you? Hey, man, choker chain, man, that thing gets on me. But, you know, Donna, you can loosen yours, too. And uh, you can let yours loose. And uh, when you other than music and uh And I'm going to hit that topic sometime this year. Other than music, I I really don't know probably any other issue that's probably uh, as contested or hotly talked about as as baptism as well. You know, in some churches and some preaching and some people believe that salvation is essential to salvation, Dwight. They do. They believe that, you know, it's it's both. You, You can't be really saved or finished saved or even partly saved, or wholly saved, I should say, unless you add baptism to it. And then there's other churches, of course, which we believe that salvation has nothing to do with salvation. That, is a, that it is an external identification. It's a testimony of what a person has done inside their heart. And, and, and some believe both, or some teach both in both views. And, you know, the question is, though, how can view, these views be so diametrically opposite and, and, and how can these views uh, have so much opposition to them in the subject? And, and it's really simple. And the, and the answer is this, that there are verses in the Bible to support both. There really is. Not that you can be saved through baptism, or, or I should say there is that, but, but there's both views. And the issue is, okay, well, if there's both views... And there's both scripture to support both. Which one do we believe today? And really that goes back to 2 Timothy chapter 2. You should be there. I want you to look at verse 15. The Bible says, study to show thyself approved. Now, let me just say this real real quick and up front. That if you plan on growing in 2011... And you plan on growing just by reading your Bible. Can I, can I help encourage you and could I admonish you just for a moment? That just reading your Bible will not help you grow. The Bible says study. You and I need to study God's Word. We need to get in there and look up words. Look up definitions. Other than, I, I use I use. I use three things when I study. Actually, four. I use God's Word. Amen? That would be helpful, right? I use a Bible dictionary. Uh, I use Nelson's Illustrated uh, Dictionary. That's the best. If I was stranded on two islands or an island and I could have two books, I would choose the Bible. And Nelson's Illustrated Bible Dictionary, I really would. I'd use those two or have those two. And Nelson's a good one. Um, I typically use and look up uh, Greek words or Hebrew words in what's called uh, Strong's. It's, a, it's another Bible dictionary. But then fourthly, I may look at some commentary. But, but at the end of the day, the last three go away and I just end up with my Bible. And for you and I to to grow in God's Word, it's important that we study. And when I give you definitions like the word reason, where 
The Bible says that they reasoned among themselves. When, when, when Jesus was talking in, in, in the scriptures, and, and Jesus says, why do you reason among yourselves? Well, I looked up the word reason, and all I did was look it up in a dictionary, a Bible dictionary, and it told me that it comes from the word dialogue. We get the Greek word gives us the word English word dialogue. It means that they talked among themselves. They began to dispute. They began to dialogue and to discuss what he was saying. And instead of just believing Jesus, they reasoned it out. Well, that's what you say. And I want you to know that words in the Bible are very important. But when you read it, and, I, and I'm all for reading it. By the way, you've got to read it to study it. Okay, amen? And so you can't study it without reading it. So I just get granted and given that reading is a part of your daily diet of spiritual growth. But to study. And, and some of you may feel like, well, my goodness, I haven't studied for years. It's difficult for me. Listen, I know. It's the hardest thing to do. But, but can I tell you, it's the best thing for you to grow spiritually and to grow deep in God's Word and be grounded and rooted in God's Word. You need to study, as 2 Timothy 2.15 says. And the Bible says, to study to show thyself approved. It's our Awana verse. It's the verse that every child that attends Awana knows. Then it says, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. And here's where the issue is. Rightly dividing the Word of Truth. See, the Bible teaches both on baptism. It teaches that, uh, that, that, that salvation came through baptism, but then it also teaches that salvation is of grace and it's a free gift and has nothing to do with works. And you say, well, pastor, wh where do we land? Well, we must rightly divide it to figure out what we're going to believe. The problem is that, no, that usually when someone teaches, now listen, when someone teaches that baptism is essential to salvation, it's because they have not looked at any other cross-references in the Bible to see if there's any, any other verses that talk about it. Not that the Bible is in conflict with itself, because it is not. The Bible is without error. But if the Bible says something, now listen, if the Bible says something that you think it says something different than what another scripture may say, two things are really of the issue. So if you come across some scripture and it appears, I use the word appear, that it appears that there may be discrepancy. It appears that there may be some, there may be some error in the Bible because one verse says one thing and another verse says another. There, there's only two results or two conclusions to get, get to. Either one, God has written a fallible book. Or number two, I don't understand the context in which it was written. Guess what? It may be because I don't understand the context in, what it was, in which it was written. I promise you, according to God's Word, as we read from 2 Timothy 3.16, that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Listen, God's Word is true, and it's profitable. And so, therefore, if I come away with the conclusion that there's a, there's a conflict in God's Word... I am wrong. Amen. You can say amen right there. Because you and I will be. God's word is all right. Is always right. And so therefore, that's why the issue of baptism is su such a crucial issue for the believer. So what is the dilemma? On the screen, the answer is to do what 2 Timothy 2.15 commands us to do. And that's to rightly divide the word of truth. So in, under, in order to understand that, that's why I'm going to talk about hot topics this year. That's why I'm going to talk about problems. We all have them. And how do we deal with problems? How do we deal with conflict biblically? How do I go to a brother I have offended? And how do, how do I make that right? And how do I reconcile one individual with another? And, and how do I deal with when someone talks about uh, homosexuality? How do I talk about when, how do I deal with it when someone talks about abortion? And, and, and that they're, that they're pro-choice. Well, my friend, I'm pro-life, and so is God. And you may have a choice, but I want you to know your choice comes with consequences. And you will, will stand in judgment and accountable for what you've done for the unborn baby. And so, therefore, we must look at God's Word. We cannot draw a conclusion of our own. We cannot get our own soapbox. We cannot stand on that. We cannot have our own self-elevated platform to figure out, you know, what, we, what people will like the best about us. No, no, no. We will rightly divide God's Word and study it out 
and figure out what does God's word say about these. I'm going to talk about marriage. I'm going to talk about marriage, uh, divorce, and remarriage. I'm going to talk about the single adult. What, what, what does God have for the single adult? I want you to know God's word says a lot to the single adult. It will surprise you. And he talks about the single adult in the same chapters that he talks about marriage. And we're going to talk about those things. We're going to talk about pornography. We're going to talk about profanity. I'm going to deal with all those things. And of course, all those subjects are on our website, our new website. And you can look those up and figure out where we're going in the next few months. But it's very interesting how people will come up with all kinds of conclusions and humanistic thoughts without ever consulting God's holy word. My friend, it's not your opinion, your fault that I need. I need God's word in my life. What does God's word say? And so tonight, that's what we need to talk about. And in your handout, there are divisions in the books of, in the book of Acts. Everybody wants to go to the book of Acts, and I'm, I, I'm, I'm happy for that. It's a great book. But the book of Acts is Acts. It just what it, it's just what it is. It's a book of transition in the Bible. And what happens is people go to the book of Acts and then tries to draw doctrine for the church age today out of the book of Acts, and it doesn't work. Because the book of Acts is a book of transition. And I want to show you that tonight and show you just very briefly, and it's in your handout, there's nothing to fill out. And this is how the Word of God is broken down. From Acts chapter 1 through 8, the key figure is Peter. And by the way, the Catholic Church goes to Peter and calls him St. Peter, and they bank and, and, and ground their church on St. Peter. My friend, we're not supposed to follow, uh, follow St. Peter. Okay, We're to follow Christ and Him crucified. And I want you to know that this, that, and when the Bible says this rock, you know, this church shall be built on this rock, it's not talking about Peter. How can the church be built on a man? Listen, that's fallible. That's sinful. My goodness, get away from that teaching and get to God. And But when we don't rightly divide God's word, we come up with all kinds of garbage. And I want you to know, people have been taught that stuff, and maybe you've heard that stuff and been taught that stuff. My friend, get in the Bible, study it, and grow yourself. My desire here as the pastor is to, div- to, to grow up people and, and Christians who will become self-feeding. Self-feeding. I want you to become self-feeding. Not just waiting on like a, like a bird, waiting for its mother bird, waiting for me to drop some nuggets in your mouth. Those things are great. But listen, don't make up your dietary supplements and food based on what I give you. Go home and get in your Bible. Amen. And I want you to do that. Why? Because that's going to help you grow. And it's going to help you grow a vibrant faith like this morning. But all things can come up if we just fail to rightly divide the word. So Acts 1.8, but what about Acts chapters 9 through 12? Well, we see the transition from Peter to Paul. You see a transition, especially in Acts chapter 9, where the apostle Paul, which is, his name was Saul, was on the road to Damascus. And you go and you see that, and you see his rem- remarkable and miraculous salvation. I'm sorry about that. But what you'll notice is that here Saul was the greatest persecutor of the church. He was persecuting Christians. And Jesus met him on that road and asked him a profounding question. Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And then he recognized in Acts chapter 9. I'll tell you what, let's just go. I want, I want you to see this. Now, we're not going to spend any time in Acts. We'll get back to all that because I want to I get through the lesson. Boy, I just blew past Acts. I went all the way to Matthew. It was weird. Acts chapter 9. Now, now look at this. I'll, I'll just show you a couple of verses here. Uh, just, uh, let's just go to verse 4. He's on the road to Damascus here, Acts chapter 9. You there? Say amen. Okay, good. Verse 4, and he fell to the earth, and he heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, this is Paul now, who art thou? What's that next word? Lord. Mm. 
And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the bricks. Hey, hey, moron, you've been standing up and kicking against the same God. We are one in the same. Do you think that was an eye opener for, the, for Saul? Sure it was, because God changed his name to Paul. And, 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 and at that moment, that's when God started delivering him to the message or the message to give to the Gentile nation. And the Bible says in verse 8, And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, by the way, that's a glorious day at salvation, when your eyes became open. The scales fell off. The darkness became light. And you knew and recognized who the Lord was. That was Saul. And the Bible says that he eyes were opened and he saw no man. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. Thank you so much. Oh, look. Hired. That's nice. I better sit it right here. I'm going to trip. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to knock that over. Hold on just a minute. This is going to make you thirsty. That's nice. Amen. That's good stuff. Anyway, you see the transition from Peter to Paul in Acts chapter 9. If you really want to read a remarkable story, you ought to spend a little bit of time in Acts Acts chapter 8, 9, and 10 and start to see what God did to Saul. And then immediately after he saves him, after he rescues him, immediately in verse 20, it says in straightway he preached Christ in the synagogue synagogues that he is the son of God (laughs) he's pulling men and women and children from their house and dragging them to jail asking to persecute asking if he can kill them and put them to death for what they believe and now he's going out and preaching that message (laughs) it's amazing to me but from Acts 13 to 28 in your handout Peter disappears off the historical record And Paul is the key figure from that point on. It's amazing to me. Did you know that Peter and Paul had two completely different ministries? They absolutely did. Go to Galatians, if you would. Galatians chapter 2. We're going to be in the Bible a lot tonight. So I hope that you came prepared to study your Bible for the next few moments. About 15 or 20 minutes. If uh, we don't get through it, that's fine. But Galatians chapter 2. And look at this with me. Galatians chapter 2, verses 7 through 9. Here's two different messages. They're, they're, they're sent to, to two different groups of people to give two different messages. And people absolutely miss this. Look at verse 7. Galatians chapter 2. But contrawise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. Folks, look up here. I'm going to ask you a question. Who is the circumcision in this? Nation of Israel, that's right, Jews. Who are the uncircumcision? Are there two different messages happening here? Yes or no? Are there two different apostleships happening here? Absolutely. And what you notice is that if people don't get a grasp of this or understand this, you'll never understand the issues like water baptism and any basic Bible principle. Paul didn't get his message from Peter, and he also didn't get it from the disciples. Paul got his message directly from Jesus Christ. How do you know that? Well, you're in Galatians. Go to Galatians chapter 1. And I want you to look at verses 11 and 12. They both had important and unique ministries, but they were very different. One wasn't better than the other, necessarily. I'm just saying that they were uniquely different. And we must understand that. Look at verse 11 of Galatians chapter 1. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. Thank the Lord for that. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught by it or taught it, 
but by the revelation of who? I believe I can trust what Paul teaches and what Paul has wrote because he got it right from Jesus Christ. Look at Ephesians chapter 3. You're in Galatians. Go to the right. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians. Go to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 3. All these verses should be in your handout. They are. Good. Galatians chapter, or Ephesians chapter 3. And look at verses 1 through 3. If you're there, say amen. If you're there, say I got it. Okay. If you're there, say I'm going to get it. You were a little weak on that. All right. Let's read. For this calls I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. Well, that's clear, huh? If ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, word, how by or how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery as I wrote afore in few words. Folks, there's a mystery that was hidden in the work of the cross. And the work of the cross was the grace of Jesus Christ. Peter didn't understand it. The disciples didn't understand it. But God revealed that right to the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul said, that's the message I'm giving to you today. It's the mystery of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which no longer is hidden, but is given to me, you word. Woo, that's good stuff. Thank God for the Apostle Paul. Listen, that's where we get our doctrine from, from for the church age today. Not from the book of Acts, but from these books. And if you read these scriptures, you would expect them to be different, would you not? Sure you do. There's no way you can read these scriptures and say, well, they're of the same message. They're given the same message. No, they weren't. They, in fact, were very different. I want you to do this. Let's see. Yes, it is in your handout. Go to 2 Peter. 2 Peter. Ooh, this is a good one. This is a good one right here. 2 Peter 3. Second Peter chapter 3. What a blessing. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. And account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. Even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which, now look at this, this will knock your socks off. Are some things hard to be understood. Is that in your Bible? Because that's in my Bible. Which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Peter recognized Paul was given a different message, and even I myself don't get it completely that's from his own words folks he recognized that there was a different message given to Paul to give to us you know Peter eventually did come to an understanding of Paul's gospel though go to Acts chapter 15 Acts chapter 15 isn't this good this is why I like Sunday night and, and Wednesday night Man, we just get in this thing and woo, we're all over the place. We're from scripture to scripture. And that's why I love Sunday night and Wednesday night just to dig in our Bible. <clears throat> Acts chapter 15. Look at it, verse. We'll read verses 7 through 11. Acts chapter 15. I'll wait for you to get there. All right, and when they had, or when there had been much disputing, look at this, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, you know how that a good while ago God made choice among us, that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. 
And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did to us. And put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why tempt ye God to put a, a yoke upon the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? Now, here, Peter raises up and he addresses the issue. And here, you start to see that Peter does start to understand that it's no longer a law that you must follow. It's no longer a religious ritual or system, but it's the grace of Jesus Christ that you must put your faith in or accept for salvation. And Peter starts to recognize that here and starts to address it and tells them, listen, even our forefathers who followed the law can no longer keep the law. And it's just a yoke of bondage when you try to place the law back on an individual. My friend, you can try to keep all the Ten Commandments. And I thank God that he took the commandments, which were over 600 and some, about 645 or so. And he, and he summed them all up into Ten Commandments. Listen, my friend, he could put them in two commandments if he chose to. But we could not even keep the two commandments, whatever they may have chosen to be. You and I have broken at least ten of them, if not if, if not just four or five, we've broken probably all of them. But I want you to know it's not about the law because you couldn't keep the law. But Jesus himself came and fulfilled the law because he was the law and was tempted like we were. But the Bible says yet without sin. He fulfilled it. He didn't come to break the law. He came to fulfill the law. And therefore, Paul is saying, and as Peter is even agreeing, listen, if you try to live under the law, you're going to go right back to bondage. Your daddies couldn't do it. My daddies couldn't do it. Our daddies, 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 daddies couldn't do it. And so therefore, you recognize that he had an understanding of Paul's gospel. But you know that the only time Peter is mentioned here is right here in Acts, between Acts 13 where, through 28 when he disappears. That this is the only time he appears again. This is the last time. And yet churches and preaching will go back to Peter and will, and will make doctrine for their church out of that. And I want us to examine the, the word of God tonight about baptism. And this is really part one of this part during Christ's earth, earthly ministry and before the Apostle Paul. And tonight I want to give you two points if I get to them, if, fine if I don't. But the first one I know I'll get to. And that is in your handout, baptism under the Old Testament law. We have to look at that. Someone may immediately question this and say, baptism wasn't part of the Old Testament law. My friend, you're wrong. You're wrong. Hebrews 9, 8 through 10 is discussing the Old Testament tabernacle and sacrifices and says that divers' washings were a part of this Old Testament system. I'll tell you what, let's just go to Hebrews because we got some other verses we need to look up there. And me just quoting it, I don't think. We'll give it justice. Let's look at it. Hebrews chapter 9. And let's look at two verses and then we'll go to chapter 6. But Hebrews chapter 9. Let's look at verses 8 through 10. They're in your handout. Good. The phrase diver washings here in Hebrews 9, 8 through 10 is the same word translated baptisms in Hebrews 6 too. We'll look at that in just a second. But, but look at these verses, if you would, 8 through 10, Hebrews chapter 9. The Bible says the Holy Ghost is signifying that the, that the way and the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while at the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifice that could not make him that did the service perfect, as pertaining to the conscience which stood only in meats and drinks and divers' washings. There's that word. Same word as baptisms. And carnal ordinance imposed on them until the time of Reformation. Here the writer, and a lot of people don't agree on who the writer of Hebrews is. I, I, I tend to lean towards the Apostle Paul writing this. I, I can't really give you a whole lot of... Uh, it's my opinion. Okay? 
you'll, you'll, you'll read a lot of different writers who disagree or agree and whatever. The people have come up with all kinds of stuff. But uh, if it wasn't him, it may have been someone that was very close to Paul and that knew his teaching. But either way, it doesn't matter. Okay, It's God's word. Amen. But, but here's the thing. Here it is. They're talking about, listen, what we realize is that no one through washing, no one through baptism, no one through traditional sacrifice, no one through the offerings can be made clean. But look at Hebrews chapter 6 and look at verse 2. Hebrews chapter 6 verse 2 it says, Of the doctrine of baptisms and of laying on of hands and of resurrection of the dead and of eternal judgment. Here what you see is this. In your handout, according to the Bible, the washings of the priest and the sacrifices were baptism. They spoke of ceremonial cleansing. And the phrase diver washings is the same word as baptism. Okay? It's the same word. But what you notice is that here under the Old Testament law, because this is a reference to the Old Testament law, and we must go there to, to confirm that. In Exodus chapter 29, go there. You have Genesis, Exodus. Go to Exodus 29. What you start to see is that according to the Bible, there were washings of the priest and, and of the sacrifices and, and those were called baptisms and this is spoke of ceremonial cleansing and, and we've already talked about when Jesus was baptized the picture wasn't for him to be baptized for the remission of sins that's what Israel was supposed to do Peter preached baptism and the remission for the remission of sins that's what Peter preached but then, or John preached, well then why did Jesus get baptized? Well, it sure wasn't for sin, my friend. That's heresy. So if it wasn't for sin, then why was it? It was a picture that an offering was getting ready to happen. And he was being cleansed for the offering for the final and complete sacrifice for sin. But you never hear anybody bring that up or even draw that conclusion. And I'll tell you why. Because they failed to rightly divide God's word. Now, I'm not saying they're bad people. Listen, I don't know. I don't, can't judge anybody. All I'm saying is that this is the conclusion that we must come to when we look at all the scripture that is in context. Because if we don't come to this conclusion, then this book must have errors in it. Because there's conflict. Well, my friend, I cannot leave it at that. I must investigate it. We must study it together and figure out where we are wrong in our thinking. And so therefore, in Exodus chapter 29, look at verses 1 through 4. And this is the thing that shalt do unto them to hallow them, to minister unto me in the priest's office. Take one young bullock and two rams without blemish, and unleavened bread and cakes, unleavened tempered with oil. And wafers unleavened, anointed with oil, and wheat and flour shalt thou make them. Thou shalt put them into one basket, and bring them in the basket with the bullock and the two rams. And Aaron and his sons thou shalt bring unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And, and look at that. And shall wash them with what? With water. This was a part of the ceremonial cleansing. Now, if you would, go to Leviticus chapter 1. Leviticus chapter 1. And look at verse 9 with me. Now, I know this is probably a little heavy for a Sunday night. But... It's just good stuff, and it's a great Bible study. And this will give you a very vivid picture and a clear understanding of why you can appreciate baptism for today. But look at verse 9. But his inwards and his legs shall he wash in water. And the priest shall burn all on the altar to be a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire, a sweet savor unto the Lord. It had to be washed. And that's the baptism under the Old Testament law. The next thing in your handout is baptism under John the Baptist. 
I'm only going to give you just a little bit of this, and then we're going to be done, if I may. So we understand that baptism happened under the Old Testament law. It was part of a ceremony and cleansing. The washing of the priests and the sacrifices were baptisms. But if you would go to the book of Matthew, and here, Matthew chapter 3, this is baptism under John the Baptist. And boy, a lot of teachers go to this and preachers go to this, and that's fine. But let's just keep it in its proper context. And as the book of Matthew opens, we see John the Baptist proclaiming to Israel. What is he proclaiming? Well, look at Matthew chapter 3, look at verse 2. John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, verse 2, and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. On the screen and in your handout, John is announcing that the Messiah is coming, and you better get ready. Israel was in a state of apostasy from God, and John was calling them to repent and turn to God. God was desiring through John, you get them to repent, preach them that judgment is coming. God's imminent wrath and judgment were a part of John's message. And verses 7 through 12 tell us, tells us that. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said to them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth, therefore, fruits meet for repentance. That means fit for repentance. And think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the roof of the tree. Therefore every tree which bringeth forth not fruit or good fruit is hewn down and cast into fire. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. Do you see that, folks? But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to bear. Who shall baptize you, look at this, with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Man, it's a different baptism coming. And John was telling them, but for the moment, get in the water and repent. Verse 12, whose fan is his hand, and he will thoroughly purge, purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Let me tell you something. If you would have heard that message in the day, I'm telling you, I'm sure that it was preached with fire and brimstone and that it was preached with urgency. And John was telling them, listen, God's judgment is coming. Get baptized and repent for the time is at hand. Now, folks, we don't preach that message today because that's not the message that God has given us to preach. God had long promised Israel a Messiah who would deliver them from their oppressors and reestablish Israel's glorious kingdom over the entire earth. God said that there would be a kingdom of priests unto him on the earth out of Exodus 19.6. Remember, what must a priest do before he could function in the priestly position? What was he supposed to do? Does anybody remember? He's supposed to wash in water. That's right. And as John comes proclaiming that it's time to gather the nation together and prepare themselves to function in that kingdom, what does John require? Very interesting. Look at verses 5 and 6. Matthew chapter 3, same chapter. Then went out unto him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan. Look at this. And were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. My friend, look up here. Baptism, confession. Do you know what we do today? Confession, baptism. Big difference. Say, well, I get the confession and baptism, but what if I never do the baptism? Okay. Okay, that's fine. The confession is what you need to get to heaven. You need to be cleansed of your sin, not dunked in water. 
They had to be dunked in water. My friend, if that was the case for us today, every time you took a bath, you'd get saved. Just stay at home. You know? Fill it up and enjoy it. That's not what we preach today because that's not the message. I stop with this because there's so much more to give under John the Baptist. Isn't it interesting that John baptized believing Jews in the Jordan River? Did you catch that? So what's so significant about it? This is the place that Israel crossed when they first went into Canaan to possess the land under Joshua. And it's the same place where Christ will enter at His second coming. This is a significant spot in regards to Israel's kingdom. <laughs> it's all there. But people miss it. There's so much in God's word for us to understand and to learn. And I hope that Sunday nights and Wednesday nights are a great time for you in the Bible. They are for me. And tonight, baptism during Christ's earthly ministry and before the Apostle Paul, they're very different. Peter's message was very different. We see that baptism under the, law, under the Old Testament law was for cleansing and for ceremonial cleansing and for the priest and divers washing and baptism. But then we also see John's baptism. And his baptism is one of repent. You need to be baptized and repent of your sin. Because God's judgment is coming. And by the way, we still preach repentance of sin because God's judgment is coming. It's still coming. John thought it was going to be in his day. Peter thought it was going to be in his day. Paul thought it was going to be in his day. Paul said, looking for that glorious hope. Man, Paul thought it was going to be in his day. But it didn't happen. It could be today. So what should we do? Repent. Don't fill the tub. Repent. Saved by the tub of the crucified church. No, wait a minute. Blood of the crucified Lord. I'm not saved by the tub. I'm saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. I know I'm, you know, being a little bit facetious. But folks, doesn't that make sense to you? Say, we're preacher or... Does that mean we're never going to baptize here? No, we're going to baptize here every Sunday, first Sunday of the month. We're going to schedule baptisms. We're going to save them. And every first Sunday of the month, that's what we're going to do. Say, why are you doing it the first Sunday of the month? Just to save cost. That's the only reason why we do it. Just to save cost. Filling the tub up, heating it, and running it every day. That's the only reason why we're doing it that way. But we do baptize, and we do it because individuals choose to get baptized. But what are they doing it for? As a testimony to others, I believe in Christ as my only hope to heaven, and I want others to see of my belief. That's why we do it. You know, I'm also going to talk about baptism under Christ's commission to the leaven. What was that about? What was Christ talking about when he was talking about baptism and his commission to the eleven? But then we're also going to talk about baptism under Peter in more detail. And so next Sunday night, we'll continue this series. I hope that this has been a help and encouragement to you along the way. And I appreciate your faithfulness. I really do. Continue to pray for our Sunday services and our Wednesday services. You know, do you remember that song? There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. And I know that it's the Spirit of the Lord. Some of you, yeah, you know more. That's all I know, sorry. But you know what? I really believe that about our church. I believe there's just been a real sweet, sweet spirit of the Lord here. And I believe it's a work of the Lord. I really do. You know, God keeps sending us guests each and every week. And I appreciate your prayers, your support. And I appreciate your faithfulness because it makes a difference when you're here. And by the way, if all of you decided not to come, you know what? It'd be hard to have church without you. Why? Because someone has to work in nursery. Someone has to work in the children's ministry. Someone runs Awana. Someone runs the video and sound booth. Someone hands out the papers. 
someone even makes coffee and donuts and puts all those sausage biscuits together. Dennis and Kathy. You know what? All those ministries, by the way, make a difference. And if one Sunday you decide, hey, I'm out, I quit, I'm not going to do it, you know that ministry will suffer. We'll, we'll, we'll find a way to do it, I promise you. We'll get it done somehow. Probably won't get it as done as best as that you do it, as good as you do it. But people suffer when you're not here. And I want to encourage you to be faithful in the days to come and the weeks to come. Because what you do matters to that guest. You know that friendly smile, that friendly handshake, that welcome that you give someone, just tell them, I'm glad you're here. Welcome to freedom. Hey, can I pray with you about something? Listen, in the last couple of weeks, we've had so many people come and make decisions right here at the altar. I told the guys, the deacons on Saturday, the guys we were praying, I said, wouldn't that be a wonderful thing if we had to replace the carpet just down here? Wouldn't that be something? Just wear it out. We just wore it out. Say, preacher, all that other carpet in, in, your, in, in the church looks good, but that, that on the platform looks horrible. You ought to change it. Hey, hey, that's indicative of lives being changed. Let's leave it the same. It'll always be a reminder that so many people came here and dealt with the Lord and got their heart dealt with through Jesus Christ. And so I want to encourage you, keep praying, keep being faithful, and let's keep rightly dividing God's Word, okay? Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you.